All right, so this is the second lecture of the thorax chapter, and in this lecture we're going to be talking about the diaphragm and then the accessory muscles of air aspiration. So the primary muscles responsible for movement of the thoracic cage are the diaphragm, which we'll talk about in a lot of detail in a little bit here, the intercostal muscles, and then the transversus thoracis muscle, which is shown here in this diagram. And this is a posterior view of the sternum. And this muscle, it attaches from the, the second rib, third rib, fourth rib, fifth rib, and sixth rib, all the way onto the sternum. So all these, di all these different attachment points. And really, this doesn't have a major function. If you, if you recall, you know, muscles contract, and so they shorten. So they just kind of depress the ribs a little bit, help kind of decrease the, the area of the thoracic cage, but again, not much of a major function. You have the subcostalis muscles, which these muscles go on the inner surfaces of the rib from one rib to the next. Sometimes they just go one rib down. Sometimes they skip a rib, and they'll go down like this, so from the third to the fifth. And really, again, these muscles, they don't serve too much function. Sometimes they like to get tagged on anatomy practicals, so be aware of them, be aware of this. You know, especially when you take that, that chest plate or uh, rib plate with the sternum off to do your dissection, pay attention to that as well, because sometimes they'll tag these. <clears throat> and then you have the levator costarum. Now these muscles, if you look at a posterior view here, so if you have the spine come down like this, and then you have the ribs kind of fanning out like this on either side, the levator costarum, these are muscles that are very small, and they kind of go from on near from the thoracic vertebrae down to the ribs, and down like this. And <clears throat> these don't serve a huge function, but what they're thought to help with is forceful inspiration, so taking a deep breath. So just something to be aware of, not super high yield. Now the main player, the diaphragm. Now it's a dome-shaped muscle, so at the bottom of the thoracic cage it's like this. Um, it's a dome-shaped muscle in the resting position and it's at the inferior thoracic aperture which is kind of the inferior opening of the thorax and you could think of the diaphragm as a kind of a border between the thorax and the abdomen and it's the major uh, muscle that drives inspiration and then the innervation is the phrenic nerve so there's two phrenic nerves one on either side and they come down like this and they innervate if you were kind of split the diaphragm in half hemidiaphragm or half a diaphragm. So one hem hemidiaphragm has one phrenic nerve, the other hemidiaphragm has another phrenic nerve. And then the blood supply is the periocardiophrenic artery, which kind of runs with the phrenic nerve, it supplies that. And then you have the musculophrenic artery and then the uh, inferior phrenic arteries. So those three sets of arteries are responsible for perfusing this large skeletal muscle, the diaphragm. So the diaphragm has three main openings where structures from the thorax will pass into the uh, abdomen. And the way you can think about this is that the diaphragm is a dome-shaped structure like we talk about. And you start with the IVC like this at the T8 uh, vertebral level. So that's your IVC. And then you're just going down the slope like this. So going down the slope. And so next in line is the esophagus. And this is just where these structures lie anatomically in the, in the thorax. So first you have the IVC, then you go just lateral and you have the esophagus. So that goes down at T10. And then lastly, you have the aorta. Just lateral to the esophagus, you have the aorta. And that's going to pass at T12. So it's going to just go a little bit further down the slope. And so another way you can think about this is just remember T8 for IVC. And you just go by twos. T8, T10 for esophagus, and then T12 for aorta. So again, just going down the slope. So some of the mechanics of the diaphragm, when it's in its resting position, it's, a, it's in this dome shape here, as we can see in the diagram. And when it contracts, that's what drives inspiration. So when it contracts, it flattens. So you get to kind of this flattened shape. And what that does is it opens up the thoracic cavity here. So it increases the volume of the intrathoracic cavity. And so if you remember that relationship of pressure to volume, they're inversely related. So if you increase your volume, increase the thoracic volume, you're going to decrease the pressure, and that's exactly what you've done here. So you decrease the intrathoracic pressure, and what that does is it creates a gradient. So you have the atmospheric pressure out here, um, and so what that does is it makes the pressure inside the intrathoracic cavity less than the atmospheric pressure, as we've indicated here, and that's what drives the air to come into the lungs by creating that gradient. Now what pushes air out of the lungs? The diaphragm is not involved in quiet expiration at all, so just natural resting um, expiration. The diaphragm has no role in that whatsoever. Um, what that is driven by is the, is the elastic tissue in the lungs. And so if let's say you have um, your alveoli here, which are kind of sacs within the lungs, that which is where the air travels to, 
and then this is where kind of gas exchange happens where air goes into the bloodstream so these have a bunch of elastic tissue all through them all throughout and so what they do is it's just like stretching a rubber band um, if you stretch it out like this during inspiration, stretch them out like this, on expiration it's just going to naturally recoil back in. The elastic nature of it is going to recoil back in. It's going to recoil back in like this. And then again, that pressure volume relationship is going to decrease the volume, and then it's going to increase the pressure within the alveoli and then push the air out. So again, on expiration you decrease the volume within the, you know, in the lungs, and then you increase the pressure within the lungs, and then that pressure is greater than the atmospheric pressure and again drives the pressure out. So that's what drives quiet expiration, it's just that elastic recoil. So a clinical example here is um, paradoxical movement of the diaphragm. So what we show here in this diagram is you have loss of the phrenic nerve here. So you have loss of just this one, the left side phrenic nerve. So the normal, the right side of phrenic nerve is still normal, it's still uh, working fine. So what happens is, is what we'll show is, the, is we show the abdominal cavity here in this diagram because it plays a role. The abdominal cavity also has its own volume and its own pressure, just like how the thoracic cavity has its own volume and its own pressure. And so we'll, I'll show you how that um, relates in a second here. So what happens is, is the normal phrenic nerve drives inspiration. So what happens is, is the hemidiaphragm, so this half of the diaphragm, works totally fine. It, it descends down and flattens out. So what that does is though is it decreases the volume within the abdominal cavity. So then it increases the pressure within the abdominal cavity. That increased pressure it's got to go somewhere so then it goes and pushes on the um, de-innervated side of the diaphragm, this hemidiaphragm, and pushes it up and balloons it up. So that's why you have paradoxical movement because you have the one healthy side that descends and then the de-innervated side which um, does not descend it actually you know it balloons up or pops up like this um, and so this is you know creates problems with you know breathing and um, movement of air within the within the thoracic cavity now another clinical correlate with the diaphragm diaphragmatic hernia so what does this involve it involves abdominal content so you know your diaphragm in this thing would be like the like this blue line here so if we draw it in like that at the inferior thoracic aperture here the inferior inferior opening of the thorax and so what happens is is you have you know, let's say you have your colon down here, or your bowel, like this. Um, what happens is you have a break in the diaphragm, and then the bowel contents can come up into the thorax cavity. And as you can imagine, that creates a lot of problems. You know, you can affect the lungs, affect breathing, affect the heart potentially. So not a good thing to have happen. And this can be either congenital or it can be acquired. Um, so you can see it in um, infants or you can see it in, um, you know, particularly in trauma in adults. So congenital um, diaphragmatic hernia. So what this is, what this results is, it's an improper fusion of the embryological diaphragm. So if we look at the diaphragm kind of like as a circle here from superior, during development you have all these folds that kind of come together like this, and they kind of fuse in. And so what happens is you have tr a problem with fusion. So like it leaves a hole in the diaphragm. And now I mean that hole can be kind of like this size, or it could be much bigger depending on how improperly fused. It this occurs. Um, and so what results is what happens as a result of that is bowel contents can then herniate through this um, through this opening in the diaphragm. And what as a result, since this is in, in utero during development, this can result in pulmonary hypoplasia because what happens is as you can see in the radiograph here, this is a signature radiograph of congenital diaphragmatic hernia, is you can see the bowels kind of um, herniating through. I mean you look at it, it's taking up almost this entire left side of this child's thorax and so you can notice the bowel because you can see kind of the the way it's you know the stacked on each other like bowel is and then you so you still have the normal lung here but the problem is is this left lung is going to undergo hypoplasia because it's not allowed to grow and develop because the bowel is herniating there and occupying the space so these patients you know when they're born they, they you know they can have severe respiratory distress um, and have you know severe problems as a result of that these, this is something that needs to be corrected surgically pretty, pretty soon right after birth. Now, if it's acquired, more so an adult, this is usually due to trauma. And it's usually due to trauma in the thorax. And so what happens is if we draw the diaphragm in here like this, is, is it's usually like you know, high, you know, high impact trauma causes huge rupture of the diaphragm muscle itself. So it actually ruptures the muscle. And so what happens is, is then is you have this huge hole in the, in the diaphragm and then just like in the children, the abdominal contents can protrude up into the 
thoracic cavity here and then that can cause problems with you know pressing on the lung pressing on the heart um, and so this is really a medical emergency and it needs to correct be corrected uh, surgically so just to kind of get into the other main muscles of respiration so you have the intercostal muscles which we have this nice cartoon here to kind of show you the three layers so there's three different types there's the external which is this one um, this is the internal and then this is the innermost so pretty self-explanatory um, innermost and what I should point out first is the fibers so the fibers of the external kind of go towards kind of you know medially and inferiorly so they kind of it's the there's a expression called like hands in your pockets so if like you put your hands in your pockets that's kind of how the the fibers will travel now the inner um, internal in, uh, intercostal muscles these ones they go there are their fibers are orthogonal or perpendicular so they go um, more superior um, and so superior medial and they go so they're um, just uh, perpendicular to the external and then if you have the innermost intercostal fibers they actually parallel the internal so in innermost and internal both do the same thing external does um, something different and goes diagonal or uh, I'm sorry perpendicular so more inferior medial so that's important to know um, the origin of all of these muscles is the lower border of the ribs and then they insert on the upper border of the rib below them so as you can see that here so they originate from you know this ri this rib here let's say it's the you know the third rib this would be the fourth rib so they insert down onto the, the rib below them on the upper portion they're all three innervated by the intercostal nerve so it's whatever nerve is what is you know so this is your you know this is your costal groove here and so you have your intercostal nerve so these are that's what innervates all three of these now the function is a little different and it has to do with kind of the fibers and the orientation of the muscle so the external these actually elevate the ribs and that helps expand the cavity so it kind of in you know expanding that volume like we talked about decreasing the pressure helping move air and this is more during like a kind of active inspiration um, and so what happens is if you notice like the way the fibers are is they're, is they're kind of going to pull um, if we kind of clean this up for you so if you know these fibers if they contract remember muscle fibers they contract they pull bones or structures closer together it's going to kind of pull pull this kind of the pull the rib cage that way and so that kind of helps open things up so the internal and costal those they have two kind of functions so there's a costal part and then an interchondral part now costal is for costals for rib and this is the portion um, that is involved in the rib and then the chondral part is kind of in the center and where you know the sternum is and where the cartilage you have that cartilaginous insertion on the sternum that's that's the portion of the muscle there and so with the costal part so out here more laterally with the rib what these muscles do is they depress and retract the ribs and what does that do it kind of compresses the thoracic cavity so if you look at the thoracic cavity like this um, so what these do is they kind of uh, retract and then compress so like from both sides that kind of helps that decreases the volume and, and kind of expels the air so it decreased the volume increase the pressure and what does that do it creates that pressure gradient drives the air out of the thoracic cavity now the interchondral part does something different so they're two opposite things so in the in the center here you know if you have your sternum here like this and you have your cartilaginous you know insertion points here what this does is it kind of expands it helps elevate the ribs so it elevates them up and then it helps expand the cavity so it's doing the exact opposite so if you go like this thoracic cavity here in the center is they're kind of um, ex helping expand out from the center and so what does that do that increases the volume decreases the pressure helps move air in so that's involved in ac active inspiration now the innermost intercostals they do this same thing as kind of the interchondral part of the internal they help elevate the ribs and then expand the, the cavity uh, the inter the thoracic cavity and so that kind of makes sense here they um, expand the, you know they kind of, they contract here like this and then kind of pull the ribs out like that and expand the cavity to help move air in um, and really what's we'll talk about this more in the mechanics of breathing but the diaphragm is the major driver of quiet inspiration these intercostals tend to get more like if you actively try to take a deep breath or if you're like you know you run you know do you go for a long run and you're breathing heavily then these muscles will kick in but really if you're just sitting chilling um, it's your diaphragm is kind of the major and can kind of do it on its own
And just to close out here, just kind of talk about some other accessory muscles of respiration. So what do these do? These aren't, they aren't, they don't play a primary role in inspiration or expiration, but they do assist with breathing when needed. And the two, two examples of that are the neck muscles. So you have the sternocleidomastoid, which is a muscle in the neck that helps with rotation of the, of the head, and then the scalene muscles as well. And both these muscles attach to the rib cage. And what they do is, you know, when you, when you need kind of powerful inspiration, um, you ha they help elevate the rib cage. So it depends on the effort you're putting in. If you put a lot of effort in and take a deep breath, these muscles can help elevate the rib cage and help inspiration along. The other thing, um, the other muscle, group of muscles is the muscles of the abdominal wall. They can also assist with more so active expiration. And in the next lecture, when we talk about the mechanics of breathing, we'll talk about how these muscles play a role in active expiration. All right, and that closes out our discussion of the diaphragm and accessory muscles of respiration.